Good afternoon, um, everyone who says it's um, My great pleasure um, on behalf of um, the Department of Linguistics to um, chair this um, session, uh, which is a talk given by Dr. Carolina Gurch. Gurch. Gurch, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, Carolina um, is probably um, familiar to many of us um, because uh, she has uh, recently completed her PhD study from this very Department of Linguistics at SOAS. Right? And she's now um, doing a, a postdoctoral research and acting as a postdoctoral research associate still at this department. Exactly. Right? Um, so her talk today is, uh, which is a long title. <laughs> it's a very Who long Who has idea. the right to know the interaction and how to find that out? Lessons from field on, um, lessons from, right, field work on um, Amazonian, Quechua, being across linguistic perspective. Right. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I know this sounds like quite a mouthful, mouthful and it might be a little bit intimidating, but I'll do my, my best to sort of unpack this talk as we go. You know, it's actually very exciting to be here because I remember being here as a student coming to these seminars and a lot of things going over my head. So I was trying to do this talk in such a way that you would kind of all be able to take something away from it. If you have any questions, then there should be enough time uh, later after I've talked to kind of figured it out and maybe without further ado there's some weird things going with the display so if I'll try to sort of adjust that exactly so then you can't see parts of it anyways so what I will be talking about today it has to do with Amazonian Quechua the language I've been doing my PhD on but not only that uh, first I'll give you a little bit of, a, of an introduction into both the language and the project that I've done for my PhD because essentially this talk is sort of a very brief recap of uh, what I've been doing for the last, say, six years and uh, trying to see where, what else can be done in that field, potentially what you could do with, for your own research because there is a lot to be done. Uh, so we'll start with evidential systems in Quechua languages. Uh, from that I'll move to evidentiality within the epistemic domain, sort of broadening, broadening the research questions to see how evidentiality fits with other phenomena. Uh, then we will talk about epistemic authority. I'll explain what it is in a second as well, so it, sh it should be fairly clear when we actually come to that. And then we'll uh, end with some conclusions, as usual. So, starting with Amazonian Quechua. Uh, it might not look like that from you know, the orthography that I've been using, but actually Amazonian Quechua is a member of a Quechuan language family that you are probably, most of you might be familiar with. Um, it's the largest indigenous language family in South America, and this is a map showing you kind of where it spans. So starting in northern Chile and Argentina, going all the way up to southern Colombia, uh, the language family has about 8 million speakers, uh, as far as we know, because it's hard to get accurate data. And you probably know, and you can also see on this map, that it's mostly spoken along the Andes. So the language I've been working on is in Ecuador. That's also why it's called Quechua, not Quechua, because they decided to call it Quechua on the basis of just the free vowel, free uh, way vowel distinction rather than the five uh, way vowel distinction introduced by contact with Spanish. And this form with a K and a CH the, and the W, it's actually a recent orthography development. So I've been using that because now it's a preferred orthography. And this language is quite extraordinary in terms of the language family because it's spoken in the Amazon. So mostly Quechuan culture and languages are associated with the Andes. And this is a very different cultural milieu and also very different uh, linguistic influences and cultural influences which are hard to unpack because we know quite little about the history and the linguistic history of the Amazon. All right, so moving swiftly on from this big map, um, a little bit more about Quechua in Ecuador. It's one of the 14 indigenous languages spoken in the country. It's a relatively small country by South American standards especially. Uh, there are several varieties spoken all over the country, about seven officially, and three of them are spoken in the Amazon. So um, I'm saying Amazonian Quechua, even though you might have seen some references to my previous research when I was saying Tena Quechua, 
and this is because I was referring to uh, Tena, that's the capital of the province where I've been doing my fieldwork, but there is multiple problems with that because there is also a river by the same name, the language is actually spoken 50 kilometers away from the capital and there are other dialects that are small, uh, spoken near. So me and some uh, of my colleagues working in the same area have sort of decided that we are just going to say that we work on the Amazonian Quechua varieties. I'll show you a map which shows that in more detail in a second. Uh, so just to keep that in mind, that actually Amazonian Quechua, as I refer to it here, is uh, a dialectal grouping. And I've just been doing work on one of the dialects within that grouping, uh, which for the purpose of this talk I refer to as the Upper Napo or Tena Quechua. So that's not an ideal name, but we have to go with something. And according to the data that we have, this particular language variety has anything between 20 and 40,000 speakers. And, but it's really hard to get accurate data again because the sen uh, census that's been done, the most recent one in Ecuador in 2010, it's not actually specified, it's not asked the people who filled it in to specify what language they speak. So the only way that you can determine which dialect of Quechua they speak is on the basis of their residence, which obviously is not ideal. So there are issue with the, issues with the data to which we have access. It has so Quechua as, uh, as a whole, so these seven dialects are regarded as one language within the constitution and uh, it has been given the status of an official language of intercultural relations. So Spanish is the official language and then two of those 14 indigenous languages, Quechua and Shuar, are the official languages of intercultural relations, which means that they have sort of semi-official status in the territories where uh, people who speak them live, which is not all over the country. Um, there is pressure on the dialects of Quechua, both from Spanish, the dominant language of the country and the continent, in fact, and the unified Quechua, which is an official version of the language that has been introduced in the 1980s. So there has been a sort of unification reform, orthography has been unified, and that has been implemented as the official variety of this minority language. So as it were, it's having a, according to what I've seen, a negative effect on the vitality of the language uh, on the local level. Uh, and there is language shift in progress. So in my field site, uh, the oldest people to communicate with everyone in Quechua would be in their sort of late 20s. And the kids, the, the teenagers have passive knowledge of it, they know it quite well, but they wouldn't use it amongst themselves. And the children mostly would use Spanish, talking to one another. Mm. It might be a little bit different in villages which are further away from the main roads because mine was sort of relatively well communicated with the outside world, but it's still not looking great. Right, and this is the map I mentioned a while ago. Those are the different Quechuan varieties spoken in Ecuador. So you've got sort of five of them here within those yellow lines. This is roughly the Andes. And then you've got two shades of green. There is another one which I'm not sure that you can see sort of to the right up there, very bright green. So those are the Ecuadorian, the, sorry, the jungle varieties. And my field work was around this place. So around the town of Tena. And we will zoom into there now just so that you can see how this looks. Right, the display is not great. I can see a little bit more than you do on the, right, this might be better. Uh, right, it's not really going to let me do this. So the village where I've been working mostly is roughly there on the river. And you can see that this is the Andes, right? And we are descending into the Amazon. So from there on, it's basically jungle all the way down to the, uh, to the Atlantic coast. So we're only just entering the Amazon. And there is, this map doesn't really show that great, but along the rivers, you can see that the vegetation is not as dense because there is a lot of cultivation going on and the landscape is being dynamically transformed both by herding of cattle and by oil explore, exploration and all kinds of pressure for land. It has to be said that the um, population of Ecuador has increased fourfold in the last 60 years. So it has gone from 4 million to 16 million and that's generating a whole lot of issues which also impact uh, language vitality, but that's a matter for a whole different talk. Right, so in terms of how this language looks, because I've already told you that it's a little bit different, well, little, it's quite different from uh, Andean varieties in terms of culture of the speakers, but actually linguistically it's also quite distinct. So as any other Quechuan language, Amazonian Quechua is suffixing, 
so no prefixes, maybe apart from one that I found in, over the course of my work. Uh, agglutinative, the dominant word order is uh, SOV. However, in the data that I've been looking at, I found that actually now the SVO, which is sort of Spanish influenced word order, is equally permissible to most speakers' ears at least. And there are also discourse related factors that influence uh, the word order. So there is that to be, uh, to be sort of thought about, even though if you look at typological literature, then probably you'll find the information that Quechuan languages generally are SOV. So that's still dominant, but uh, ever less so. Then there are evidential enclitics. So uh, evidential particles which attach to the end of the words, actually to the end of phrases, they can occur on any phrasal category, hence enclitics. So you might have heard of evidentiality as part of the tense aspect mood morphology. That's not quite how it works in all these languages. They are basically independent markers which are not integrated with the tense aspect mood system. And we'll be talking more about this later. Uh, they're basically singled out because that was the topic of uh, my dissertation. And the cognates are there, but when I started looking at them, quite a few important differences with the sort of established evidential paradigm also came up. So I'll talk you through this in a bit. In terms of what's really different in Amazonian Quechua from uh, Peruvian Quechua or Andean Quechua in general, actually in, Equ in Ecuadorian highlands there are also no adjectives. So uh, only pulmonic consonants. We've got both voiced and unvoiced stops and that's particular to the Amazon. Whereas in the Andean varieties you only have the voiced, uh, sorry, the unvoiced stops. And that's also the unified Quechua orthography. It presents it in this way. So people who have been ex exposed to, to this orthography tend to lose this distinction, but it's actually there. Uh, there is no exclusive inclusive first person distinction. So no uh, pronouns for me and you, but not you and all of us together. That's not existent in these, uh, in these varieties. There is only residual object marking. So in Peruvian, uh, Quechua and the Quechua that's a Quechua that's morphologically complex, more complex, you would get obligatory marking on the verb for both subject and object. That's not the case in the Amazon. There is only, so subject marking is still obligatory, but there is only one uh, object suffix that remains and that's for the first person plural object. And there are quite marked lexical differences. And that's probably, we did know little about this, but partially probably because of the fact that it's a very different environment that we live in, so different animals, plants, conditions, and also different influences from a, a totally separate group of contact languages that the Andean uh, Quechua has not been in touch with. So that's where we stand on the language. And my PhD project basically, cons that's, that's, that's the outline of it. It was an ELDP funded project, so I was fortunate enough to be funded for three years to do it. Uh, because it was an ELDP funded project, documentation of the language was a requirement. Mm. So that meant I actually had to go and do field work and create a corpus of the language apart from working on the issues that interested me from the theoretical point of view. I've done about 10 months of field work, two longer trips, six months and four months. Because when I went to the field, the sort of anthropological documentation project was finishing there, I stepped into the anthropologist's shoes and I was fortunate enough to inherit a collaborative project. So I had people who could already operate a LAN quite well, they were computer literate, and I've been working with a team of five, five at some times, and seven, even we grew up to seven people at certain points, doing transcription, translation, a segmentation for me as well, and actually we did some training as well, so they went out and recorded stuff on audio and video. That's actually quite important. We managed to create a 13 hour corpus that's all audio and video. And there is, this doesn't include elicitation. So I've been doing my elicitation sort of on the side, but the 13 hours, it's all videotaped, all taped, right? Uh, and it's 11 hours of naturalistic discourse plus two hours of sort of elicited discourse where I would present them with stimuli to have a rel relatively controlled discourse setting, to know what people were talking about and to kind of keep it simple. But it's all monolingual, so it's very, very nice data to work on because 
people were there on the ground from day one to help me do this. And for some documentation purposes, that was really great because some people didn't want to see me. They would be intimidated if I was around. So basically, the Quechua researchers just went by themselves and recorded these people, or went to events that, I, that weren't accessible for me. And all this, uh, these 13 hours have been transcribed in Elan, uh, translated into Spanish, and basically revised two times over. So I looked over them, and then I came back to the transcriber. We looked at it again, uh, looked at our differences, and then kind of reconciled them. And the shorter part of the corpus, which is the two hours, it's parsed and glossed on the morphological level. So that was the basis for my PhD research. And the initial focus was on the analysis of uh, evidential markers. And I'll explain now why it was the initial focus, because when I went to the field expecting to find something, I found something quite distinct, in fact. So just as by means of a reminder, what is evidentiality, right? Evidentiality uh, indicates the evidence the speaker has to support uh, their statements. That's Palmer's take on it. And that's actually the revised Palmer's book on mood and modality. In the previous version, the 1986, he was looking at evidentiality as part of epistemic modality. And in the new version, uh, epistemic <laughs> modality and evidentiality are sort of both within propositional, mod mod propositional modality, but we'll come to that in a second. Linguistic marking of the source of information, that's the most uh, well-established definition from a big monograph on evidentiality by Eichenwald. And the more recent one is the coding of mode of access. And we don't really need to dwell on this for very long, but what's interesting about that is that people who have come up with this last definition claim that the source of information is sort of always the same. So sun is shining, that's the source of information. However, what matters for the marking of evidentiality is how I access this information. So it's a more precise definition to their ears. And actually, when you go on the surface, when you've just sort of heard about it, it might not make much of a difference. But when you start looking at what individual languages do and how speakers use it, it actually makes a lot of sense. So this is all quite abstract. So just to sort of show you what the literature has been saying about what kind of things can be marked by evidential markers. We've got the sort of two main types on the left hand side direct evidentiality and indirect evidentiality. Direct is also attested, so that means that we've experienced something through the senses. More often than not, that would, for uh, language marking systems that would, evidential marking systems that would incorporate all kinds of sensory evidence. Uh, but there are some languages which would also distinguish all the things that you can see sort of on the right hand side. And indirect evidence, that's anything that's non-sensory. And here we've got sort of two main groupings. One is reported evidence, so hearsay, which can be secondhand or thirdhand, and then there is folklore, which is different because it's hearsay that's sort of replicated by the community. Again, not all languages make that distinction, but a lot of them do. And then we've got inferred uh, evidentiality, uh, which, and the inference can be based either on results of an action or on reasoning. So if we I don't know, come over to John's house and he's not there, but we know at the time that we came to visit, he normally plays football. We say, John must be playing football. And that's based on our general experience inference uh, from reasoning. However, if we uh, come to our house and we see that there is a vase that's broken and our dog is sort of nowhere to be seen, we see the results of the dog breaking the vase and we see the dog must have broken the vase. So that's inference from results in very simplified terms. And now in Quechuan languages, what we traditionally have is the three-way distinction between direct, reported, and inferred. So there is one marker for all kinds of direct evidentiality. And then we've got uh, the verbal reports and then uh, inference marked with other markers. This is how it looks in practice. So a very simple example from uh, Martina Fowler's thesis on Cusco Quechua, so that's actually a Peruvian variety. We've got three markers at the end of an inflected verb, right? Para uh, shan mi, it's raining, I can see that. Para shan cha, maybe I'm in the house and it's dark, but I can hear the rain banging on the roof. So that would already count as inference because I don't actually see the rain. And reportative, someone told me it's raining. Uh, however, so that's basically 
when I went to the field to Ecuador, I was expecting to find a neat freeway paradigm like this. Didn't happen. So I found out that the reportative marker was not there at all to start with. And instead, people were actually using a um, construction which would incorporate a verb of speech and me. So the direct evidential and the verb of saying, which is not uncommon cross-linguistically, <coughs> but it's not how it was supposed to be working according to the data from uh, other varieties that I've seen prior go, uh, to going to the field. And then I started digging deeper, and I will just show you what I found on uh, the example of me, so the direct evidence particle, because that's the one that I sort of had the most time to analyze, and I think that's the one that I managed to also analyze in most detail. Can you see that okay? Is it? Sort of, right. So we've got, uh, what I found out is that actually uh, in Tena, Quichua, Amazonian Quichua, we cannot find a one-to-one -one correspondence with, with the types of evidence that I showed you a while ago and how this marker would occur. So we've got uh, me with direct evidence. It's raining, I can see that, that's fine. But we also have it with inference. So the similar situation to what I just described with John going to play football, uh, Cesar Mingama Mirishka, I'm pretty sure Cesar went to go and work in the field with other people because I know him, he's not at home, so I infer and I can still mark it with this direct evidential marker. Uh, I am in the house, I hear steps outside, I was expecting my father to come, so I say uh, because uh, I infer that, but again it's okay to use me in this context. And then the sort of most striking one is the guesswork one, and I need to give you a little bit more context for this. It says, Lukipurama mirin, Lukipurama, means the seat goes to the left, to the left. And that was an experiment that I've done where I had people watch the free shell game with you know, the cups and the seed. And I cut the clip so that first they just saw the magician performing the trick, but they didn't see where the seat has ended. And then the second time they watched the whole thing to be able to see whether they actually guessed correctly. So these guys that, that said that they've been watching this thing for like, I think five or six uh, uh, cases of this game and they've never guessed correctly. <laughs> and this was the sixth guess or so and still they were using the me. So it's either guesswork or inference but definitely it's not the direct evidence. And one thing I should also comment on, you can see on top that it says direct visual BPG. So BPG stands for best possible ground, and that's taken from the work of Martina Fowler on Quechua, uh, sorry, on, uh, on Cusco Quechua, where she said that basically we need to expand the category of direct evidence because some facts in the world are just not accessible to us. So for things that pertain to our sort of life experience, the best evidence is indeed the direct evidence. However, if, for example, we've never left Europe and someone tell, who has been to Africa tells us there are elephants in Africa, if we know that this person is trustworthy, we can just accept this sort of as, uh, at face value and incorporate it into what we know about the world. Because it's something that's not accessible to us, we can treat this hearsay then as the best possible evidence. So there is a difference between what Fowler calls personal information and encyclopedic information. And she was saying that in Cusco Quechua, uh, me could basically mark both of them. But that's, you know, as you can see, this is a sort of broader array of cases than just the direct and best possible evidence. Right, so, having found this, I wasn't really sure what to do with that. Because I was familiar with evidentiality and epistemic modality, I, as I told you, I read up on things. And those are the things that I was expecting that might be maybe marked there somewhere. So propositional modality. But then this marker wasn't doing that. That didn't really fit. So it's not exactly the way I'm telling this. It's not the order in which it happened. I think you probably can't see that, which is sort of semi on purpose, but I'll talk you through that. And so I came up this sort of newer research, which was saying that actually uh, epistemic modality and evidentiality are two aspects of epistemicity. It's the white thing over there, probably can't see that very well. We could also switch off the slide if I knew how to do that without switching off all the others. So if someone does know that, then please go ahead. Okay. And so, um, let's see. 
Anyway, so, oh, that's better, isn't it? Not really. Okay, so that's the only thing that's, that's in white, so it doesn't really matter. I can just talk you through that. Um, right. I, I don't really mind, it's up to you. I know what it says. Uh, right, so basically this newer research, instead of thinking in terms of modality and how evidentiality is a part of modality and where it belongs, Casper uh, Boy said, okay, this is something that's called epistemicity. And it is so because basically these two things, epistemic modality, which has to do with sort of support for factual status of propositions, so in simpler words, whether I judge something as possible or not, and whether I, and whether I know that something happened because I've seen it or because I've heard it or because I've inferred it, are kind of two kinds of uh, epistemic phenomena, so epistemic as related to knowledge. Evidentiality has to do with epistemic justification, as he calls it, because it's how we justify what we know. And epistemic modality has to do with uh, epistemic support. So how much do we support what we know, right? Are we willing to vouch for it because we think it's certain? Or are we maybe not so willing to vouch for it because we're not so sure whether it's certain or we might think it didn't happen at all? Uh, so when I kind of came across this way of thinking about it, I started to think, okay, that makes sense, but that's probably not the only two dimensions of knowing uh, that are out there. And what else can we sort of relate that to? And that's when I sort of opened the Pandora's box in terms of my PhD. Uh, so basically, uh, the current look at this, and epistemicity is sort of a term that I've been using. It has had different definitions in the literature. So Boy has used it to refer to just evidentiality and epistemic modality. Uh, but Bergfist, for example, in his 2017 recent Lingua article, has been referring to it as a broader phenomenon. And that's sort of the outlook that I've adopted. So epistemicity here is all the sorts of phenomena in discourse and grammar that are somehow related to how we know things in interaction. And I'll talk you through these different facets of it that we uh, know about so far, but just to, because I said, you know, different dimensions of knowing. What does that mean exactly? So within conversation analysis, there has been quite a lot of work on this already, but we might not be very familiar with that as language documenters because that's not the things that we really do, right? We concentrate on different level phenomena. So I came across this, uh, which is effectively different dimensions of knowledge and interaction, and that was done by conversation analysts who work on sort of more familiar languages, if you will. So you can see we've got epistemic access, primacy, and responsibility. And if you look at what it says, knowing versus not knowing types of evidence, degrees of certainty, this is already covering evidentiality and epistemic modality, right? Certainty, possibility, types of evidence. And this is but one of these dimensions that they have found to be manifest in conversations and languages such as English, French, even Japanese. Then we've got epistemic primacy, which is related to the right towards knowledge. So how much can I know, possibly? Uh, how much can I know with respect to you? Uh, who can claim this knowledge in conversation, in interaction? And then the third one is about obligations or rights to have certain information. So that tends to arise somehow by virtue of context, but you could imagine what this would mean that, for example, if you are in a situation where, I don't know, you approach a professor, the professor has the obligation towards knowing certain knowledge, right? So it arises by virtue of who you are socially. And that's all socially constructed. So it was really when I came across this that I started thinking, okay, maybe this has something to do with what I've been seeing with this me uh, in Quechua. Uh, but it turned out that there is, so right, so we've got epistemicity, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, and then I started looking at a sort of broader array of phenomena that have already been described for different languages that have to do with the dimensions of knowledge and interaction. And the one that's sort of relatively well established apart from evidentiality and epistemic modality is mirativity. Those of you who do Tibeto Burman might have already heard about it because that's where it sort of originated. And this has to do with marking of unexpected information. And some people also refer to it as uh, marking of the fact that the mind of the speaker, of the addressee also sometimes is unprepared 
for receiving certain information. So I realized that something, right? It's a periphrastic strategy in English, but you do mark that as well discursively that you haven't known something before. And I'll just show you an example from Chechen, actually, that's taken from work by Martina Bruy, who was citing someone else. Uh, let's see whether I can go a little bit. Right, that's better. So you can see how this works. We've got Zara has come. I knew she was going to come. But then you mark it differently if you weren't expecting that. So something maybe along the lines of like, wow, Zara has come. Or, oh, she's come, when you haven't been expecting that. And that's actually marked by a dedicated uh, verbal suffix in Chechen. So that's one uh, episteming system uh, that we already know of and that's been, that originated with the works of Scott Delancey, so beginning of the 1990s. So it's been around for quite a bit. Right. Then we've got egophoricity, which really is a fancy name for conjunct disjunct marking systems, uh, which have been first analyzed also in the 80s and were initially regarded as related to person marking. And this uh, monograph that's about to come out now about egophoricity, or maybe it's already come out, says it's related to primary knowerhood. So that's sort of about, again, rights and obligations to know. It's very fuzzy, but actually that's kind of where, where we're at. We're trying to figure out in this field what these markers are doing. A simple example of that uh, is from Tibeto Berman from Navarre. Uh, and it kind of shows you why it's uh, related to per it was thought to be related to person marking, right? Because we've got I went with A, which is uh, ego stands for uh, egophoric and allo stands for allophoric. So the A marker um, basically implicates personal involvement. And then we've got you went and she went because I'm not involved in these actions. So there is, it's not a, it's so much a person distinction, but it's a distinction bef, between whether this action is somehow involving me or is it everybody else. And it can also be exploited in discourse. For example, the non-egophoric marking, so the allophoric marking, can be used uh, with first person, person actions when you do something unintentionally to sort of show you that, show this, the interlocutor that you weren't involved with that. So related somehow to person uh, at first glance when you look at it, but actually it's not. So that's egophoricity for you. Right, and this is where it's starting to get really complicated uh, because this is all recent work. And I personally am still to figure out how this relates to the kind of overall domain of epistemicity that I told you about because I think we are getting dangerously near kind of reduplicating it. So complex epistemic perspective is a, com it's a concept coming from, again, the work of Henrik Bergqvist. He says what it has to do with is asymmetries of access to information. And then engagement, uh, which is another notion in the development of which Henrik Bergqvist, the same author, has also been involved, essentially, I think, gives a more fancy label to the same phenomenon. That's why I included it here. I don't really want to show you examples because, again, we could spend the entire talk talking just about that. So relative mental directedness of speaker and addressee towards an entity or state of affairs. It takes a lot to unpack. What it means essentially is what you see above, uh, which is how engaged we are in what we're talking about. And does their take on it, they subsume a, a lot of different phenomena, which to my mind are more precise. Uh, about how you can know things, how you relate to people, but essentially what's important about this is that this is intersubjective, right? So this has to do not only with how I relate to the proposition, but also with how I relate to my interlocutor. So essentially there is that. That's why it's different from the other things we've seen. The mirativity is about whether I am surprised. Uh, egophoricity is about whether I am involved. And this has to do with a third dimension of there is more than just one person talking and we have to deal with that. And as you see, both these references are basically one is not even out yet and the other, uh, the other one has just sort of come out. Uh, so this is all new and that's why I'm showing you this basically just to watch this space. Uh, right. And then there is epistemic authority. 
And that's kind of what the rest of the talk is going to be about, because when I started looking at how this was defined in the literature and what this enclitic, enclitic me in Tena Kichwa was doing, I figured that that's probably the closest to its meaning that, that the epistemic domain has sort of come. So epistemic authority has uh, to do with the relative rights to know about some state of affairs, as well as relative rights to tell, inform, assert, or assess something. In simpler terms, again, work from conversation analysis, primary right to evaluate matters assessed. And one thing that I forgot to put on this slide, which I found very enlightening, was uh, work by a Japanese lingui linguist, Akio Kamio, from 1997, uh, about territory of information. So his work basically says that there are different kinds of things in the world, in our sort of uh, awareness, uh, about which we can know to a, different, to a certain extent. So I, you know, I basically speak here today from an expert position on epistemic marking in Tena Kichwa, because you know less about it than I do. However, if I was talking to a native Kichwa speaker, we wouldn't be in the same situation, so it's a dynamic thing. Uh, and the territory of information uh, of uh, any given person comprises of information that's sort of close to them. So it can be information related to their personal experience, profession, family members, etc., etc. And essentially what Camille was saying is that in conversation you negotiate some sort of a confluence between uh, different territories of information. So again, it would be weird for me to, for example, I don't know, comment to Peter on Australia because I know nothing about Australia and he's, he was born there. So I cannot act as an expert because Australia is within his territory of information, not mine. And interesting things start to happen when you have people with competing claims to information. Right, and so epistemic authority uh, is not that new in terms of linguistic inquiry, but it's only recently that we started looking at it within language documentation. Uh, there is conversation analysis work on it in English, where how it's marked linguistically is through turn design, so through the structure of conversation. And uh, this isn't really very clear, I think, this thing below, but I extracted it from the PDF because I wanted you to see all the transcription conventions for conversation analysis. This is uh, Veronica and I think Jenny talking about Veronica's grandchildren. So Raymond and Heritage say uh, the first assessor, the person who knows most, is likely to speak first. And that's Veronica speaking not very uh, fondly of her grandchildren. So oh, I think it's mm, a nice little devil. I, I don't think it's nasty, you see. Uh, with Gillian, she can be a nasty little bitch. So that's a grandmother talking about her <laughs> grandchild. Okay, all right. And her friend is, well, you're saying mm, something is that it's, mm, it's a shame, isn't it? Kind of thing. So she is trying. It's kind of a shocking claim, right? You just heard someone say that about her granddaughter. Uh, but she's not competing. She's sort of aligning with that position, uh, trying to position herself with respect to that. And that's what English is doing in this regard. Uh, this is sort of a default thing where you've got first assessment, which is an assertion. But you could also frame it as if it was a question and then it has to do with how you negotiate the sort of epistemic right. I know this is a lot, but I just wanted to show you this to kind of uh, so that you can see that there has been work done on this in English. Now, a slightly easier example, I think, to gloss. The first line should all be in italics. Uh, this is from Jamin Jung uh, Galiburu, and here I'm not talking as an expert because obviously Candide is expert on that language, so I'm quoting a work from Eva schutze uh, who says that there are um, epistemic authority um, and clitics there, which derive transparently from uh, person marking, especially this one that's uh, first person inclusive marking, me and you. Uh, so in the first one, the Ngarndi, uh, that's sort of assertion of individual epistemic authority. I was there, you weren't. Uh, therefore, you haven't seen my granddaughter doing things with the grass trailer. And the second one is this boy has fallen over. He looked like as, as if he was dead. But we were both there. And I'm inviting you of using the Mindy uh, to comment on this. So we're constructing a sort of discursive uh, reality where we both know uh, the same amount. And that's also relatively recent work. So we've got that already. We've seen that in English. This is a language of Australia. 
And there is also a work in Japanese done on that. Uh, so in Japanese you've got two uh, discourse particles that have to do with what uh, Hayano calls epistemic primacy, which is essentially very similar to epistemic authority, but primacy implies that there is an imbalance. So one person would know more than the other. And here we've got yo, which is uh, information not shared with the recipient, so it's just the speaker's knowledge. And we've got ne, which is shared information. And again, I don't know why this literature is always about grandchildren, actually. Another example, uh, T is talking to S, and uh, S is the grandparent. Uh, so the first person says, well, how that boy walked, ne, shared information. I'm sort of being polite and I'm letting you in on this information because it's your grandchild. So I don't want to be mean and kind of, you know, say that he's really cool when really you have the right to assess him. And you can see this picked up in the second turn when the person, it's actually a combination of devices, right? But she says, he does yo, we must make him walk. So first, we, you can see that there is a combination of discourse marking, but also with tense, right? The first turn comments only on one particular instance of, of an action which we've witnessed. And the second one is a general claim about the boy. And that's where the epistemic primacy also comes in. I know more about his walking than you do. And then there is immediately referral to an action which is sort of pertinent to the grandparent and not to the neighbor who just happened to see this, uh, the child. We must make him walk. So this is relatively well described uh, for Japanese. And again, it has to do with epistemic authority. Right. And Basically, this with these empty arrows, it just shows you that there is probably other phenomena there that we're still not yet aware of that might be marked in languages that haven't been described. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's kind of what we have for now. And having discussed all this, I will just move to uh, Amazonian Quechua again to show you in more detail why I think this me marker is a marker of epistemic authority and I contrast it with one other enclitic. So if you look at this now, Having heard everything that we've heard about uh, epistemic authority as a domain, again, let me just put this out a little bit. Not sure whether that's made it any better. Bigger? Okay. Right. Uh, so the first one is straightforward, right? It's I see that it's raining. Um, ev direct evidence doesn't it can be kind of subsumed within epistemic authority. So you are likely to have authority over something if you've seen it directly. So it's not kind of an exclusive thing. So that's a straightforward example. We can analyze it as an epistemic authority case because someone has seen it, that's fine. Uh, inference conjecture, when Cesar went to the Minga, we assert that with me, if we know Cesar and we know about his routines, then effectively we could also claim uh, authority over this knowledge, right? Uh, more context would be needed there, but uh, that's, you know, that's sort of our knowledge that's already established, so easy to imagine that we can claim authority here. And same thing with uh, your father coming. You might know, you know you, just as you know people's voices, you might know the sound of their steps or you know, how they move or something like that. So it could be explained uh, that I know, you know when my father was supposed to come, it's kind of in line with my general experience of what he does, I can assert with authority that he is coming. I don't have to have direct evidence. And the last one, it might just be a purely pers persuasive thing. When I think, you know, I really guessed it, I know where it is now. That kind of thing. So I'm trying to convince you that my guess is correct because the two of us are trying to figure it out. And therefore I'm asserting authority over this guess for which I don't have basis in uh, direct evidence. All right. Uh, Doing. So that was sort of anecdotal explanation with uh, epistemic authority. Mm. But these examples actually show you that it does have to do with authority of knowledge and actually that it also has to do with exclusivity of knowledge. So me, as well as other enclitics in Tena Kichwa, also have sort of information structural associations. So me is associated with focus. Uh, it occurs on focal constituents, but it's not always there. It only occurs in about 6% of all turns in my corpus. So it's not enough to say that it's a focus marker. And generally, you can use it or you can omit it. However, there is one context where really people wouldn't agree to the sentence you provide to them if it didn't have a me, 
and that's in, that instance is uh, corrective focus constructions. So we, we've got example of uh, two of those here. Manda Nyuka Ushichu, Nyuka Warmimi. She is not my daughter, she's my wife. And I cannot say that just with the bare noun. So I'm correcting you. You have an assumption. I'm showing you this assumption is wrong. And with what I say next, I assert my epistemic authority over that. So you don't know this, I know it. I've sort of shown you explicitly and I stick a meter just to make sure that it got across. Um, the other one, Mana Atarikanichu, Tianu Kadiami. She didn't stand up, they just sat there. So again, you were maybe saying that they stood up and went. I tell you they did not stand up, they were just sitting there. I'm correcting your false assumptions. Same mechanism really, and again, this cannot be said without me. And this contrasts, interestingly, with another enclitic, which is in the same morphosyntactic slot, which is ta. And in terms of focus marking, this can be said to be associated with viewing focus. So with focus that reinforces the true value of a proposition. So this is taken from an interview with a midwife. And the interviewer is uh, asking sort of for confirmation. They're talking about what to do with a placenta when the baby is born. And she says, does the midwife have to bury it? And the midwife essentially repeats the same turn, saying, sorry, it's a little bit out of line, but I hope you can see that. Uh, so same thing, repeated information with the ra. So yes, she has to bury the placenta. We share this information because I already told you, but you're also let on on it. So it's the two of us sharing this information here. And in this case, people would maybe tell you that you can, can actually say it without the final enclitic, but they would never say that in interaction. And me is absolutely out. You cannot say that with me. So basically, this is a situation where this enclitic would be obligatory, where we share this information. I'm confirming it to you, but it's a thing that is shared between the both of us. Uh, right, shared versus exclusive knowledge in interaction. So how does it work? It's really another example confirming what I said before and uh, bringing it together. So on the left hand side, it's kind of two sets of dialogues. I'm not sure if that's clear. So A and B here, and then we've got another one there. Um, this actually came about when I was, uh, we were talking about making chicha, so traditional drink. And I said, I can't do that, mana ushani. And my good friend in the village said, ushangimi. Yes, you can do it. So she was trying to make me kind of defy my own expectations about myself. It's a little bit of a strange case, right? Because she is asserting epistemic authority over something that's my domain of experience. But she is the cultural expert here. She knows about chicha, about making it, and she knows me. So she probably knows that I have all the necessary skills uh, in order to make that drink. However, if we had a different context, so if I was already trying to make chicha and she just wanted to encourage me, then it would be appropriate for her to say, Ushangira, you can do this. Because I'm already trying, so I'm assuming and trying that I can. It wouldn't make sense for me to start doing it if I didn't think I could. So she's just reinforcing this feeling in me that I can from the position of authority saying, yes, you can do this. I confirm this, keep going. And actually me, I haven't preferred examples of this, but me is also quite often used in, uh, in, direct or in directive or prohibitive context. So when you're trying to say, uh, don't go there, or don't climb that tree, or rip your trousers, things like that. And uh, that's following this analysis, because there is something that, that we know is going to happen, but the person that's going to adversely affect the person who is performing the action, and we don't want them to do this. So we invoke this me as a claim to our epistemic authority to stop them effectively from proceeding on the course of action on which they are set. So that also confirms this authority thing. Right. And I thought it was going to take me much longer to go through this, but you're probably already saturated, so we're going to start wrapping up slowly. Uh, so this was really just a snippet of data uh, to give you a flavor of what's going on in, uh, in Amazonian Quechua. Um, and so what I found mainly about these markers, and there is me and Ta, and there is actually like 10 more of them, so I haven't had the time to explore all of them. I remember the day when Irina told me that I should probably look at all of them. 15 rather than three, that was quite shocking <laughs> in the end. I didn't look at the semantics of all of them, but I was, uh, I was able to establish that they all occur in the same morphosyntactic slot. So effectively, they can be considered as a paradigm. 
and um, they are cognates of evidential markers in other varieties, but they are semantically and functionally distinct from them. So that's kind of the main finding, and it's already pretty obvious from what I told you. However, this system that you've seen of just uh, the three um, evidential markers that mark direct inferred and reported is not universal to the whole Quechua language family. There is some new research coming from Peru, which suggests that in the dialects over there, you get systems with five or six markers even, where there is a distinction between mutual and shared knowledge. So actually, that was kind of hopeful when, in, when it, this came out, because it means that there is something to it in the way that the systems are evolving, because we also see here that there is a distinction between knowledge that we share and knowledge that is exclusive. So it's not exactly the same system, but same type of sort of pra pragmatic semantic discourse evolution. Um, these markers, again, contrary to what you might find when you look at typological overviews of evidential literature, where Quechua comes up as one of the languages of grammatical evidentiality, are not grammatically obligatory. They are more uh, dependent on, you know, on how to structure the turn, on the pragmatic needs of, of participants of this course. And that's not really that distinct from what we know about Quechua in Peru. It's just, or other varieties that have been described, which mostly happen to be in Peru, uh, where authors have actually said that they aren't obligatory. But because the work has mostly focused on the cases where they do occur, uh, there wasn't so much talk about you know, the conditions under which they occur and under which they do not occur. So it's not that this is a new thing and they've sort of been demoted from obligatory markers in Peru to suddenly occurring in 2 to 7% of turns in, uh, in the Ecuadorian Amazon. It's just that we haven't really, in our research before, looked at uh, what it is that makes them occur. But, so that's something that should probably be looked at in more detail in the future. Um, these markers, at least the two that I've shown you, are intersubjective because they don't only have to do with how I as a speaker know things, they also have to do with how my knowledge relates me to my interlocutor, so there is it's kind of a triangle. So it's not just me, it's also you, and there is also the text external word that we both relate to in using these markers. Um, and because of all of this, uh, their analysis actually needs to go beyond morphosyntax and semantics. So that's, I think, where the real challenge kicks in in, uh, kicks in, in the context of languages like Quechua. Because you've seen that we started with an English example, right? And that was already conversation analysis, because we don't even have to provide glosses for English. However, if you want to study these things in endangered languages or minority languages, you all know too well that there is a lot of ground that we need to cover before we get to this. So it means that within a PhD thesis, I could only barely scratch the surface of this. And that's why I think it's really important to sort of commit to studying these things and not to regard them as something secondary when you have pragmatic strategies and discourse. You cannot account for these elements unless you know something about it. And just because the grammar doesn't tell you what they are, you know, evidentiality 30 years ago, a lot of people were saying, oh, those are just stylistic particles, they are there for the language to be pretty. We have to walk away from that and see how we can work uh, to be able to account for this. So maybe team up with someone who does conversation analysis, maybe record a lot of natural text, so then when we understand the language, actually we can come back to it and figure out what it does. Uh, but I think we also, from the point of view of you know, creating language documentation that's representative, we have to think about this as well. It's not just enough that we cover semantics, we also have to think about discourse also because that's the first thing that's going to disappear effectively, especially if these markers are not ingrained in the grammatical system or are not part of the tense aspect mood. And general conclusions, all the Amazonian Quechua evidential analytics could in fact be analyzed as discourse markers. So discourse <coughs> markers, uh, that's coming back to Schifrin in 1987 who re uh, analyzed expressions such as you know in English. Um, syntactically non-obligatory elements that bracket units of talk and operate on the discourse level. And that's effectively what these particles do. So there has been almost, what, 40, 30 years now of uh, studying that within English. 
And I've talked to some people who have done this kind of research for English, Spanish, well-described languages. There might be a lot of interest to kind of incorporate it, but there hasn't yet been much talk about all these modal particles or weird words that we discover in language documentation. And if we look into more standard linguistics, we might find that a lot of these phenomena have been described and we might draw on that. Um, right. The meanings they express are related to ownership of knowledge and interaction, rather to source of evidence, so that follows from the fact that they're not evidential. Uh, Morphosyntactic marking of the ownership of knowledge is by far, as you have seen, not unique to Quechua. And when there is no morphosyntactic uh, marking of these kinds of phenomena, as you have seen on the basis of the English example, that doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just expressed by other means. So for me, it was quite an interesting thing to come around to because when I first started doing research, I thought, you know, mm, evidentiality is a grammatical phenomenon. Therefore, languages that don't have evidential markers, we shouldn't really consider them. And I think I've, run, I've come sort of full circle because I think we have a lot to learn from ways of expressing the semantic functional categories through other means. So to me, it's important not to get fixated on you know, whether or not we have this as a particular morpheme, because there might well be other means of expressing that. Um, right, the study of these phenomena is still in early stages of development, so there you go. Maybe that's something you might want to consider doing. And in fieldwork context, there is a challenge ahead of us in terms of devising a methodology that's actually going to work for that. Right, thank you very much. I'm done here, and those are the references. Right. Um, the problem that common ground semantics or pragmatics ran into is infinite regress. So what do I believe that you believe that I believe that you believe about that situation? Mm -hmm. um, how do you stop that? Because in, in you talked about it as intersubjectivity and making estimations of what the other person knows. Yeah, I did actually. Let me just go back a couple of these weird slides so that we can go to... Um, this example. Uh, so again, I, I have trouble sort of delimiting where one thing stops and the next one begins. But in my analysis, especially of me, and actually Ta as well, what I think they do if you look in terms of common ground. So common ground is a set of beliefs that's mutually uh, believed to be shared between participants of interaction. And in this relevance theoretical sort of question under discussion thing, the way that communication works is that we pose ourselves questions, which we then resolve. And that the answer to the question that we've been posing comes as part of the common ground. So what I think the, these markers do in terms of common ground is that the me, and it's, it's really, it's different sides of the same thing, but what it does, it's, it tells you, okay, I know you might not believe me because you were expecting something different, but actually this is what is the case. And I'm merging you, I could just say that without the marker, but I'm telling you, you know, let's just accept that and move on to the next thing, because I tell you, this is how this works. So it's sort of, and then there is another marker, Cha, about which I, my analysis is not very sound, so I didn't really want to talk about it today, but that's a cognate of the indirect uh, inferred evidentials. And what that does uh, is sort of the contrary of this, where it says, I think that this is the case, but it's not on the sort of epistemic modality level uh, on certainty or not, but like just sort of presenting it out there, but I don't have enough information for this to become part of common ground. Can you elaborate on that? And then we can solve this and store this in our set of mutual beliefs. But yeah, there is a lot more to that as well. Anyone else? But this 
still becomes this problem of regress. Oh yeah. But that's not, yes, I guess that's also my concern about, concern about this uh, whole epistemicity thing, right? Because, okay, dimensions of knowledge, it sounds appealing, it's cool, you know, it's intellectual to do this. But when we actually start pinning it down, we're, again, we're not really philosophers of language. So my issue with domains such as engagement, say, I can see clearly where egophoricity comes in or what it means to be surprised. I can sort of quantify that. But if we assume that there is a semantic functional category which has to do with everything that has to do with the imbalance of knowledge, I think effectively that is too broad to be descriptively helpful. So the, I think the whole field is stumbling into that. And uh, also there is a whole tradition of information structure uh, which is not talking to this. And it's related to the same phenomena because it's looking at how the organization within a sentence, so not discourse but at sentence level, accounts for what we know and what we don't know. So common ground is, as far as I know, what it's originated within information structure, or it's very, no, it's, it didn't. All right. So, but it was fed into there and then it came back here. And I don't really have an answer to that other than 20 years of research and then we see what we've come to. I don't know if you have any take on how this could be resolved. No, I'm just saying that mm -hmm. you're right that um, your final point, which was that you need to look interactionally and and to look. Uh, I don't I don't like this term natural discourse, but you do need to collect instances of real language use mm -hmm. to try and make sense of things. And treating it as a grammatical phenomenon in a paradigm is not actually going to lead you very far. I think yeah. I agree with you on that. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in just your methodology and your, your knowledge of Kitchener as well. Sort of how 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 fluent are you in Kitchener, um, and how much do you know about the interpersonal relationship of everybody in your field site where you're where you're working there, and how you know how basically how did your analysis come out of that right. knowledge that you have? So what I've mostly, and so my Kichwa now I think is intermediate. I can pretty much read my entire corpus without looking at the translation. But the way I pick it up, I tried to learn some Peruvian before or Peruvian Kichwa before I went there. But then uh, basically we just started recording. I did the elicitation, so I learned a little bit from that and from just infinitely reading through this corpus because recordings were coming up pretty early on and I had to look at the transcription. So the first ones were really hopeless when I was saying, oh, I think it says this. And they said, no, there is no such word. And then you would pick it up, but it was just days and days on end of trying to figure that out. And when I last went there in May, I was able sort of with, you know, kind of draft to deliver a discourse in Quechua to kind of show them my appreciation for the whole project that we've done. And we've had an hour long meeting that only took place in Quechua and I kind of was able to follow. So that's where I met with the language. In terms of the interpersonal relationships, that's tough. I think I know some about it, still not too much, but that's why I also want to keep working in the same place. But that was also the point of dividing the corpus into two parts. So I had this one where there were pair stories, you know, this and kind of narrative descriptions of simple images where I could sort of know what people knew. And then I looked at what these uh, enclitics were doing in that part of the corpus and extrapolated sort of interim results from that and then went to uh, real instances of language use, which I agree is a better term than natural discourse. And so whether there was kind of the same, pa same pattern going on or whether there was something different. And when it, there was something different, I was sort of trying to think about where it might have come from. So that was, it's patchy, and probably if you get a native speaker to comment on that, uh, they would have much more insight kind of straight away without the need to, uh, to do five years of research, but we don't unfortunately have native speakers of the language with this kind of metalinguistic awareness yet. So this we'll have to do for now. Yeah. Right. Why, why the Quechua stands for like, other epistemicity like, types? 
and or maybe what's the origin of the, of the suffixes? Right, so there is uh, this one article that I referenced, which was Heinz and Heinz. They have uh, proposed a path of uh, uh, development for these, uh, for these markers in terms of, uh, like Traugott says, subjectivity, intersubjectivity kind of thing. So basically things becoming more and more subjective and then more and more intersubjective. And that would kind of align, but the details of their analysis were foreseeing quite different things to what I found. So my PhD has only looked at the uh, syn synchronic kind of state of things, and I had maybe one section of the last chapter on diachrony, uh, but I wouldn't want to comment on that just because I don't yet know enough. I have thought about turning it into a research project. Uh, the issue that we ran into there is that um, this is very different from a lot of sources that you can access that have a kind of big historical depth, mm -hmm. because not many people have been doing this research on the basis of spoken discourse. So effectively, and in a written uh, interaction, it's a very different thing of how you project yourself and how you use these things. Uh, and in fact, in teaching of unified Quechua, there is a prescription that the me should always go on the, first, on the head of the first constituent of the, of the sentence. So I'm worried that in terms of bigger time depth, it might be hard to do that. Uh, but it would be interesting to see how it compares to Peruvian Quechua data and stuff. But the research that I know about is mostly based on uh, more rigid instances of language use. So that would have to be factored in as well. Yeah? Um, you have you ever encountered that they concord? No, they don't. That's why I'm saying it's actually a paradigm. Yeah. So the me, there is, there is eight, eight, nine in Clitics which do not co-occur, so they're in the same slot. I should have actually uh, prepared that so that you could see this. Uh, and then there is five more which co-occur with some of them. It's a little bit of a complex picture of how they, uh, how they can co-occur. But uh, the three of them that I've been talking, uh, talking about today never co-occur. So, and I tried to elicit that, but it seems that they're mutually exclusive and it's pretty unacceptable to use them together. Right. Um, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering about your experience of, um, as an L2 speaker of the language, whether you use these in critics yourself naturally and whether you got a reaction to that or whether you ever got a reaction to, to misusing them and, and did that tell you anything? I was thinking about the Japanese yo, which mm -hmm. you mentioned that as an L2 Japanese speaker, I think I shy away from that sometimes because I worry it can sound kind of arrogant or, or too strong for an LT speaker. Mm -hmm. Was there anything that, that equivalent to that, that that taught you anything? I haven't, I don't think I have sort of good enough command on the language to deliber deliberately mess up in a way that I could then <laughs> use to tell me something, <laughs> right? <laughs> Say, okay, if they said this in this context, this is what it means. I don't, I'm not there yet. However, I've been using quite a lot of the me and cha and the, the topic, sort of topic marker as well. And there is a good response to that always. So, uh, and if they thought that I was arrogant for using too much me, I haven't found out, found out about that yet. <laughs> but there are people who use more me than others. I can, I can see that with my consultants as well, at least in sort of, uh, meta-awareness level, well, I haven't quantified it, but some people do seem to voice that much more. Well, you kind of answered a little bit because I was going to ask you, you talked a bit of the relationship of the markers with um, corrective uh, focus. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was going to ask you if you've seen anything to do with topic. Focus. Yeah, yeah, I did. It's not here. Uh, sorry, I, I think I, I got over you because I was too anxious to answer the question. So a little bit of topic and no, I just, just wondered if there was any, anything that you found that may relate. So I find it interesting. This and I'm not surprised that it sort of uh, correlates with information structure mm -hmm. um, analysis. So there is this enclitic ga, which uh, has been analyzed again for Peruvian as a topic marker in. Uh, in Tena Quichua or Amazonian Quichua, it's not frequent enough, again, to warrant this analysis because it's around the same percent, the percentage is about 5% of turns. Uh, it occurs on topical constituents, again, not all of them. 
uh, but it can, go, it can also go on secondary topics and generally presupposed information. Uh, I actually have an article about this in the working papers, I think from 2016, published here at SOAS. Off the top of my head, I don't think I can tell you in much more detail. That was an interesting crossover actually when I saw that in, uh, in the real language use corpus and then I went back to the uh, elicitation I've been doing of a sort of naturalistic discourse where uh, I found when they were describing pictures, uh, a lot of times they would go like kaiga and then proceed to describe the, uh, so demonstrative, ga, the topic marker, and then proceed to describe the picture uh, with another topic marker in it, which never happened in, uh, in natural discourse. You wouldn't get kind of the stocking of the topic markers. So it's somehow related to the presupposed information. It doesn't seem, however, from what I've been able to figure out, to have this epistemic correlation. I mean, it probably does because if it's, again, you know, common ground issue, if it refers to something that's presupposed, then it is epistemic, like everything is epistemic in the, in the bottom line. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, but it's not strictly a topic marker. It covers much more. But certainly the main it started to surface a lot when we, we, we devised this picture stimuli to elicit information. And I think it's, Eva already had ideas about what it could be, but I think that it helped us at her mm -hmm. um, to finalize our um, analysis. It, it took her a good 20 years to, to finally feel that she cracked it enough to want to write a paper about it. Right. Uh, the Nabi and the, the Minju. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you the question that I thought Candide was going to ask you. Um, can you show us the Japanese example? Sure. Is that the end of the question? That's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, there we go. Um, and the question is, what about prosody? Um, the clause, if you have something like Yoko Anoko Arita ne, Arita ne, Arita ne, and um, Arukiyo means something very different from Arukiyo. You need to look at international contours. Ne. This is the case Right. So I, I, I think, you know, you've expanded the ground, absolutely, mm -hmm. but must also incorporate prosodic um, internationals. My answer to this is more funding for collaborative research. <laughs> was, yeah, two years ago, um, possibly, there was a, a, a um, one day workshop mm -hmm. on Right. But I totally agree this is much needed as much as kind of looking at uh, the position of this not only sort of within the clause, uh, but also within the turn. There is new interesting research being done on how discourse markers in languages such as Spanish are influencing their meaning by their position in the turn. And the people doing that are actually also doing prosodic analysis. So there is a lot that I would need to teach myself to do that. but this is definitely the next level, kind of trying to figure out what it is that they actually do. It's also a huge argument for having an audiovisual corpus like, like you've put together. Which mm -hmm. is, you know, too much work that's been done in this area is based on second-hand sources, which mm -hmm. are purely textual. Yeah, and you cannot analyze this adequately, I find, only on the basis of, uh, of uh, Audio. That's actually interesting. I was giving a talk about uh, similar about corpus design to people who actually only work on Spanish, and their corpus is uh, all sort of real language use, but it's only audio. And they were t asking me, so what is what is there to be gained from video? And you know, we cannot expect, especially in my setting when it was native speakers who are computer literate but not really computer savvy. Uh, no one could really do that to transcribe a four-party conversation without video. That's plain impossible. And also if it has to do with the Xs, like some people analyze evidentiality as the Xs, so that has to do with the word that surrounds you, might be pointing that's involved and a lot of cues that are given by the image that simply would lead you 
to misinterpret these markers in their absence. So, and I found that actually, at least in my context, people weren't hugely intimidated by the presence of the video camera because also that's given them something to then watch back, right? They really enjoyed that when I went back with a CD and they could see the interview and the most successful thing I've done over the whole time I've been working with them is produce this video uh, where they were talking about ethnobotanical plants. Everybody absolutely loved it. So I think there is a big case to be made for always just going for video as a default. Right. There is, yeah, there is a whole set of markers. Uh, I think, again, Henrik Bergqvist was writing about it in Kogi, where there was a marker which indicated, uh, you should know this. It's <laughs> like something, but we talked about it, right? So I'm reiterating this to you, but really it surprises me that you shouldn't remember that this is already, <laughs> it should already be manifest to you. I wonder, though, whether this mutual manifestness is not running into the same issue as common ground would run into. What does it have that really makes it all that much different? Well, it's um, said to be uh, something alternative to mutual knowledge, and it's said to be based on facts that you know about, rather than just uh, being a theoretical all right. mutual knowledge design. OK, I'll have to read up on that. Thank you. All right. And I also have no issue with sharing the slides, so if that's something interesting, I can make them available to you and they can also be uploaded on oh, the website. When it is archived, then the, the slides will also be shown along okay. the book. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you.